with Killymuck, Killymuck was um, more or less born out of a number of frustrations that I had with, I would call it the middle class theatre sphere. Um, I'm from um, a housing estate, I grew up in Benefits. Um, according to the British Class Survey, I am the precariat, or I originate from the precariat, which is the lowest of the low. Traditionally, we are perpetuated through media stereotypes as being like um, beer swilling, fag smoking layabouts. Mm. But um, what I wanted to do with Killy Muck uh, fundamentally was to kind of dispel those stereotypes and to move away into a new way of. Um, speaking of people from these class structures and I think inherent to this play itself is that it is loosely inspired by my own narrative, my own story growing up in um, going into the 80s in Northern Ireland and um, coming f out of a society that is sort of like caged within a troubles narrative so we, we do not tend to explore anything beyond that and I wanted to um, sort of show in a humorous light yeah. what it is like to grow up in abstract poverty, how structures are inherently oppressive in their makeup um, through the education system, um, through even going for jobs, mm. um, access to space, everything is designed to keep us in our box, in a box that is, will, tends to become a, a stereotype that is um, always sort of referenced when we speak of people from the lower classes. And I wanted to start a narrative that would bring change because if we don't rise up against it, change will never happen. Mm. Um, the cycle continues. The cycle continues and it becomes a question over equality and equity. Equity being that, um, equality is that um, everyone should have equal rights, equity being that we cannot attain that unless we all have the start, oh, we all come from the, the um, a level playing field, so to speak. Yeah, so disadvantaged from the beginning, they're never exactly, going to catch up in that respect. Exactly, and you seem to get trapped, there is, it, it's the, the cycle of impo impoverishment that you get trapped with and it just perpetuates and um, unfortunately the structures that are in place to help in this, this is in, in across both plays, um, tend to pull us down mm. and the oppressive nature of these structures are not designed to propel us forward and it's something that we need to get out of. We'll, yeah. we'll bring in Box Clever in a moment. Yeah. I just want to talk a little bit about the, the actress involved in, in your yeah. play, Aoife. Lots of different characters. Yes. Who do we meet? What sort of people do we meet on, so, on that journey which essentially is your story? Yeah, um, it starts off with Aoife as Neve. Um, and it is set in a fictitious housing estate called Killymock. Um, and we follow her journey and she is the protagonist and the main narrator of the story. Um, and we meet various characters along the way um, in order to flesh out that story. Um, but yeah, and Aoife's, oh, there we see her. <laughs> Aoife is absolutely incredible in this role. Um, and I guess it's that, it's that old thing of if you want somebody to play you, get the prettiest girl in the room. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to Aoife. We'll find out more about this in a moment. But uh, this is Red, who yes. is part of Box Clever. Yeah. Annabelle, you've been involved in both productions, but let's focus on Box Clever for mm -hmm. a moment. There are similarities here to the, to the narrative. Yeah, there are, there are similarities here. So we always feel like the two plays are in conversation with each other because of those similarities, but they are also standalone plays that have come from different places. So Monse Whitney is an amazing writer. She's written Box Clever and we follow Marnie's journey. Uh, Red, who's just there, um, actually plays 24 characters in Box Clever and it's about Marnie who she's made bad relationship choices um, and for various reasons she's ended up in a refuge mm. she's a good mum and she's really doing her best by her daughter and it's about the struggles of when a system is meant to help you and actually it's just not listening and it's just so many cutbacks so many restrictions on it about how you can really be trying to do the best thing 
and nobody is actually helping you because there simply aren't the resources there. Mm. Monse always says that she was sort of inspired to write the play because she realised she came across this, this information that refugees are, are run by the council and social services, but there is no duty of care in a refuge to the women, children, there are also men's refuges, to those people. Nobody owes them a duty of care and that, that just doesn't seem right that you're in a place and nobody is actually looking after you or thinking about you in that way. So it, again, like Kat said, it's about a call for action, a call to say this is what's happening, done in a narrative form with light and dark. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about Vox Clever. Yeah, interesting that you know these, these are plays which perhaps have historic context. Mm -hmm. They are perhaps not set in the modern time, but will be very relevant to the modern time in terms of actually these are issues which haven't gone away. Is that, yeah. is that fair to say? Yeah, I think that's really fair to say. I mean, especially in times now of austerity and uncertainty where people are really, they don't know what's happening. They're very unclear about what is happening politically, but also the austerity cuts in the last four or five years there are an awful lot of people who are in these positions and in this cycle and these plays portray people who are living lives now mm. and every day. Kat, how did you bring humour into what on the face of it is quite a, a bleak existence, you know, a, a, a struggle, a challenge? I think um, as a storyteller from Ireland, it, it is something that we do on a daily basis. Um, when you have a uh, a history of a people who have systematically been oppressed, oppressed by various things, um, which is like there's various theories that that's actually structurally in your DNA that you carry that through. Um, I think it's really important to see see the light in the shade, um, and I think that whenever you're trying to achieve something as valid as being counted in a structure that doesn't see you, that often silences you, because we often get grouped together in the narrative, the working class narrative, and I'm not working class, I'm not from that environment, and we are silenced and we are not seen. Mm. Um, and I think that it's really important for representation, representation of my community and the communities around us. And I think how we do that and how we display um, bleak situations is through satire and through humour and I think that's really important because these communities do have that, we do have beauty, we do have humour and if you don't laugh at yourself, mm. um, the will to survive will slowly diminish, um, mm. you just kind of get trapped and it's to sort of lift yourself out of those moments that you can so easily slip, slip away into. As a writer, you've been given a position to tell the stories of this community which is unheard of and, and doesn't get to share its voice. Mm -hmm. How do we get more people like you? How, how do we tell the young generation of these communities that there is a way for them to be able to have their voice? I think it's really, really important for theatre um, communities and artistic directors of theatre spaces to actually implement what they're saying. So we have, at the moment, we with the Me Too movement and there, there is almost like a galvanised feeling to move forward with um, creating work for women, um, but also creating work for people from minority backgrounds. And now we feel empowered to, to speak out and to, to say what we need to say um, to empower our own communities. But I think what's really important is that we have to veer away from this sort of like um, the tokenistic behaviours of these structures and we see it with various news publications they're happy to write about the communities they're happy to call us for quotes and to fill to tick a box and it is becoming a self-serving kind of um, situation where they will we will be written about but we won't be put in the space to create work we can't get these structures into viewer work it's very difficult to get published whenever you're from um, a lower background and i find that myself i have had this is my seventh piece of writing and it is the first play that i've had published um, and i have been told of you know that the goalposts were always being shifted for me and i actually do believe that that was a class issue. Um, what was the breakthrough? How the, did you get this published? I think um, there was something different with what happened with Killy Muck. Um, it is possibly the most political thing I've written. I, I never, 
ever in a million years thought I would be a political writer um, because I use humour as a way, a get out clause in every given situation. And my family are always telling me to write a comedy and every time I write something, it's like, guys, it's kind of a comedy, but it's not a comedy. <laughs> it's comedy, but it's got very dark edges. It's very, yeah. very dark, bring the tissues. But um, I think that we need more structures to open up, to let us in mm. and to view us. I think because we, we are now in a situation as well, because of funding and funding from various bodies. In order to get such funding, you need to have certain box ticked. And what they are actually doing, and it is a self-serving um, sort of system, is they're creating an area where minorities are being pitted off against each other. Just because you have um, a black person in your cast, one out of say 10, that doesn't mean that you're working towards equality. That means that you're becoming, it, it becomes tokenistic in, it, in its output. Um, I think a very good example of a piece of theatre that is creating a change and is trying to work towards change and um, seems to be employing minority people for their talent is Amelia. Um, and it's on a the West End. I love how I'm plugging another play. <laughs> uh, but it's absolutely incredible. It's an incredible yeah. piece of work and it's incredible what they have done, what they have done for women but also minority communities and I think that that's the model that we need to start mm. to, to look towards. And I think um, Chris Sonix from, uh, who's the artistic director yeah. of the Bunker Theatre, he, yeah. he has, he puts his money where his mouth is yeah. and that's what we need. When you come from communities that are impoverished, when you come from places where you don't have access to art, we need the art to come to us. We need something in place where we feel accepted in these spaces and I think yeah. Chris Sonnex has done that. And I, I think Chris has really done what a lot of artistic directors talk about but don't yeah. actually do. So instead of putting one play on in a season that, as Kat says, could could be seen as ticking boxes. He's actually programmed an entire season of voices that ensure that there is inclusion and diversity and voices that you don't hear. So Box Clever and Killy Muck are about benefits and working class issues and poverty, but the whole season, as, as Kat said, Chris has put his money where his mouth is. He's actually taken a risk. And there's one really simple way of making sure we get more stories is come and see all the shows. Buy a ticket. Yeah, that's because if you don't have a great response from the audience, if you don't have the feedback from the audience saying, yes, these are the kinds of play we want to see, we want to see these pieces, people depicted on a stage, then they, nobody else will take the risk. Yeah, unless yeah. they're a success. Yes. The, the, yeah. the rest of these artistic directors yes. will think, well, actually, this doesn't work. We'll just carry on with what we're offering audiences. And unless there's a buzz about it, are we going to get broadsheets in to review it to get in a broader audience? Yeah. It's, that's, it's a catch-22. Annabelle, how does it work logistically then to have two pieces of work <laughs> r running at the same time? Um, I think it's. I, I think I'm safe to say it's quite challenging. Okay. We had a production meeting earlier in the week, and Steph O'Driscoll, who um, directs Box Clever, actually said, and it was a lovely thing to say. She said, "I'd just like to acknowledge in the room that we are all a bit mad, aren't we? <laughs> because we're doing two shows every evening. So we have Box Clever and Killy Muck are played together every evening." Um, and it's a bit like being in Edinburgh. You have one show and then you have essentially a 20 minute interval where we change sets and have to do the next show straight afterwards. Yeah. So it's ev everything is done with a lot of good humour and it's a, an amazing creative team. I value every single person. I think without everyone working together and collaborating and caring about each other, it would be a lot harder. Yeah, it, you need to be a team to, to pull off something Absolutely. like this. Absolutely. Just just back on on that idea of, of box ticking. Yeah. You know how you know is it how do the theatres and and creators not fall into the trap of saying, well, if I'm being accused of box ticking, perhaps I just shouldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, is there a risk of that? Can you can you see that actually? It, it becomes yeah. difficult that I, I, well, I, I feel like I've, I've attempted to try and tackle this issue, but now I'm being accused of box ticking at the same time. Yeah. I think that. Um, fundamental to that is how you organize the system and how you go about um sort of like putting a team in place to represent yeah. the community and i think what's important as well is 
especially in the Irish community, and I can talk about this because I am Irish, um, we so often see stories about the Irish community mm. told by an Englishman on our stages. Um, the ferryman is an example. And I think that we need to hire more, more women to tell these stories, but also more Irish people to tell stories of their communities. Um, I, I am really frustrated about how we are constantly portrayed through the media um, you know, and on, on stage as being the ye old Irish top of the morning to you. And it's like, it just becomes, like you, off, you, you just laugh, laugh at it um, because it's not a representation of who we are. And I think that it's really important for theatre spaces to hire people from the lower class categories and to take those risks. If you're not taking those risks, you are in danger of, of just take, ticking boxes because if you're going to write about a community, why not get somebody from that community to tell that story? Mm -hmm. Because it's where we, we are most at heart. When I, I, this is the first time that I've worked with a director and I was really, um, adamant that I wanted somebody from the community that I reside in and I found an amazing person called Kat Shoebridge um, and she just gets it. She gets it like somebody else wouldn't get it um, and I think that comes with from experience in poverty and experience in life of benefit. Real understanding of, of yeah, what the story exactly. matter is about and about where can we see these plays? That's, okay. that's the key thing. <laughs> <laughs> We're on at the Bunker Theatre, which is by London Bridge. Um, we are on until the 13th of April. Um, both shows are on each night and we have a matinee on Saturday. So it, you don't have to find separate dates to see two different shows. We've made it as easy as possible for you. So yeah, we're at the Bunker Theatre. Um, which is an amazing supportive space that is giving voice to artists that other people aren't. 